Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. Discover Thrawn's origins within the Chiss Ascendancy in the first title in an epic new Star Wars trilogy, beginning with Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy. Written by best-selling author Timothy Zahn and read by Mark Thompson, Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy is on sale now wherever audiobooks are sold. This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 360. We are your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm your host, Dan Z, drinking One Nation coffee out of my Boba's Beans coffee mug that I got at Celebration, which is the perfect mug for this show because this mug reminds me of friendship, and I am honored to have Holly Fry and Amira Martin on today talking about something we never have talked about on Coffee with Kenobi. We're going to address what Daisy really said about the possibility of a change early on in the narrative of the rise of Skywalker. We will certainly address why we're talking about this topic, and we will also discuss briefly the debut of the Season 2 trailer of The Mandalorian. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some Coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first. I talk first. Joining me today for a cup of coffee are two very special guests and familiar voices slash faces to Coffee with Kenobi. First, we're going to bring in from Full of Sith and countless other podcasts. I stopped counting on my fingers because I ran out of them. Holly Fry. <laughs> I, too, have stopped counting them. So uh, it's great to be with you again, Dan. Yes, yes, it's so good. What What's going on with you these days? I know you, uh, of course are never busy and you're a very idle person but just lie down all the time and i'm fed grapes uh (laughs) grecian style yes he probably would if i asked him but um yeah so (laughs) still um still working on stuff you missed in history class uh i have a new podcast that is part of our uh iheart radio's partnership with shondaland which is called criminalia which is a a historical true crime podcast right now our first season is all about lady poisoners um i also have a podcast going until the election called why i'm voting where i interview famous people for the most part about why they vote and what motivates them to cast their ballots and then uh i am also lucky enough right now to be hosting the raised by wolves companion podcast for hbo unbelievable i mean seriously you you and our other co-host uh, always inspire me with your passion and your tireless enthusiasm I, I really appreciate the both of you so kind well i mean you did send me a nice check so <laughs> <laughs> one million dollars <laughs> speaking of awesome we as i just mentioned uh, my other coast is also an inspiration to me of course, we met on the Target Rogue One commercial that we, since we are commercial buddies for life, of course, I'm talking about Amira Martin. Yes. Hello, my brother. How are you, Dan? I am so good, and uh, I'm glad to see and hear from you and that you and your family are doing well. What's going on in your world? Oh, well, you know, we're, we're adjusting to how things are currently in the yes. world. Uh, We are still on our homeschool journey, so we've been documenting that quite a bit lately. Um, Since I now have a 15-year-old, 10-year-old, and 6-year-old, we are trying to maneuver school and all of that fun stuff that happens right here in our home and me continuing my platform, you know, talking about how to live a full life and how to have fun with your family and not spend a million dollars doing it and how we incorporate a lot of Star Wars and Disney into everything that we learn in the house and every little tidbit of life here at the Martin household. Well, I mean, your uh, Four Hats and Frugal is such a great place to go. Your social media is awesome. And, and the homeschool uh, things that you do are, I think, are really important, especially with remote learning. And of course, as an educator in my day job, I know how important it is for parents and teachers. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, you are you're a superhero, especially now. Uh, so thank you for everything that you're doing. 
Oh, you're very kind. You are very kind. So, see, you got my check, too. I love it. It's a reciprocal. <laughs> he, he actually just, like, signed the back of mine and sent it to you. Yes. Is that how that one worked? It's yeah, that's, that's the circle. Yeah, I That's the circle that we're doing right now. Yeah. Forward to on the signature. It's, yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> All right. So, we're, obviously, we're going to talk some Star Wars. Uh, the main topic is going to be uh, something where I break a rule I've never broken on coffee with Kenobi. I'm going to address... Uh, rumors slash speculations slash things that never actually happened with an interview that Daisy Ridley did. Uh, but before we do that, it would be I would be uh, remiss if I did not at least bring up the season two trailer of The Mandalorian since it debuted the day of this recording. Holly, we're going to start with you. Your initial thoughts on this amazing new trailer. <laughs> My initial thoughts might be different than other people's. That's... Quarren? So many Quarren! Are we on Moncala? That's what I'm most excited about. I love it. That's it? That's all you've I, got? I, I, like everyone else, was very excited to see the baby experience Snow mm. and to see him go into his little turtle shell maneuver um, when things were getting very real in that boxing arena. But I really was legitimately so freakishly excited to see Quarren in abundance. Isn't that great? And your your knowledge of Star Wars is, is so insanely extensive. So I love that you caught that. Uh, you, you know what else, ladies? I didn't, I just thought about this when Holly mentioned what she was excited about. There's actually going to be uh, the child slash baby Yoda footprints in the snow. Right? Is there anything oh cuter? My gosh. Oh that my business gosh. is going to be like weapons grade cute. <laughs> uh, it's just it's going to be almost too much. I just yes. I can feel it in my bones. It's so true. <laughs> Have either of you seen the, the 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 Lego mini figure of the child that came with the Razor Crest? It's the cutest thing ever. I don't, I don't think I have seen it in person. I we I think have the Razor Crest and have not taken it out of its box yet. Oh, yeah, that's how we are here too. I'll send yeah. you send you both a picture. It's pretty cute. It's so cute. You like almost want to eat it like a little mint, but don't do that. Oh my gosh. <gasps> you know what you could do though? You could <laughs> cast it and make chocolate ones. Oh, that's a great idea. Ooh. Look, I'll figure out a way to eat that child. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Amira, what about you? Initial thoughts on the Mandalorian Season 2 trailer? Uh, well, I love that they didn't show us much, which is my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love a trailer where... And I see there's a lot of speculation. There's been speculation all day. What, what was this part? And I saw a lot of Sabine talk today. Um, but I was just like, you know what? They didn't give us much... And I really appreciate when they do that. Um, and I got to see it for the first time with my six-year-old uh, because he is our The Mandalorian fanboy in the house. Um, so it was nice to see him react to, you know, everything that was in the trailer. And it was a type of trailer where he would completely enjoy it. There wasn't, we didn't get like a special storyline just yet. It was just enough to wet our palates and get us ready for October. And that's all we need right now. So I was very pleased. Absolutely. I, I don't want to know anything about the story. I don't want to see any big reveals. And no. I know this is certainly the, the uncouth thing to do on social media. But I'm not someone who's going to freeze a frame and try to guess who everybody is. I'm just going to sort of take it in, enjoy it for what it is. And and I like to be surprised. If, if I wanted to open my Christmas presents on Halloween, I would start analyzing this trailer. But I'm not that person. Yes, I agree. I agree. I think they they did very well with uh, our one minute thirty two second trailer today. <laughs> yes, well noted, uh, Holly. What about you? How do you? How are you on the, on the whole speculation thing? Where are you on that? Um, I'm sort of in the middle ground. Like I I don't mind speculating, and I I do like to occasionally freeze frame things and look at them. But as you may have guessed from my other initial reaction. I'm really more interested in the background stuff and not trying to suss out what the story necessarily is. Like to me, that's the fast track to the road to disappointment, right? Like people yes. get really attached to their theory and the odds of that ever being how it really plays out are low. And I don't, I don't want to get in that cycle. I just want to see storytellers tell their stories, but also maybe check out and see if, you know, there are any cool aliens in the background. <laughs> Yeah, things that add to the lore, things that, that borrow from the lore, because there's such a wonderful mythology that Star Wars has. So 
why not dive into that? And you know, with someone like Dave Filoni at the helm, that you're going to see exactly that. And yeah, I, and I thought it was great fun. I, I love, like you said, the turtle maneuver. I hadn't heard it described that way, but that's pretty wonderful. Uh, <laughs> So fun, so cute, and just the, the mystique of Din Djarin. I, I really like the fact that we have a, a nautical scene where they're on water on a boat. I, I don't really remember it being like that in a, in a live-action Star Wars, so that's going to be great fun. Yeah, we get, like, Star Wars longshoremen for the first time. <laughs> I love it. Yes. That's right. They're trying to expand our, our horizons here, give us right. a little bit more to look forward to. I, I appreciate that. That's right. We're all enriched because of that. What did you say? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, for sure. All right. So I don't know if this is going to be an enriching conversation or not. With the two of you, it certainly uh, is going to be. Uh, but in general, as I said at the top of the show, I don't normally address things that may have been. I like to deal with what is, not what might be. But either way, it's it's still a fun conversation. And, and what I'm talking about is last week, Daisy really did an interview on the Tonight Show. Josh Gad was the guest co-host and, you know, Josh or guest host. He's he's the best anyway. But he asked Daisy Ridley about Ray and her family, her lineage, her history. So before we actually address what was said and what's talked about, I want to ask you both what you thought and still think about the rise of Skywalker just as a motion picture cinematic experience. Amira, we'll start with you. Uh, well, so I, well, I highly enjoyed it, uh, but I did express my concern of it being like t- you, we, they tied the bow a little bit too quickly for me and they tied it so quickly and it was so rushed kind of that I kind of couldn't catch my breath when I was watching it. Um, of course, we saw it six times in theaters. But also, it's just it, there was so much that needed to be brought back into the storyline and wrapped up that it got a bit overwhelming um, with with the, the story that they were trying to tell. Now, I, I think they ended it pretty well, especially with Ray. Like, we, she doesn't have to come back. It would be great, but she doesn't. And I appreciate how it was ended um, and that JJ kind of took the time to, to do that for us. But there was just so much left. And I, 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 I wanted it to be a complete story where we weren't learning about new characters as well and not completing their story, um, but also where the, the characters we fell in love with in Seven – were co- complete, like truly complete by the end of Rise of Skywalker. And we were able to go, okay, I feel good how that ended. Um, it, was, it, just, it was a lot. It was a lot. And it still is even when I watch it. Um, it's, it's a lot to take in. And with this new interview, um, I know people are bringing back those old emotions that they may have had about, you know, how the storyline was and what we were given um, and kind of rehashing their opinions about how it should have ended, quote unquote. For sure. And Holly, what about you? Overall sort of impressions of the the final film in the Skywalker saga? Um, Of the sequel films, it's probably my least favorite. But the thing is, right, um, it's still Star Wars. So even if there are elements that I don't love about it, there are lots that I do love. Like, I'm not the biggest fan. And again, this is just my thing. I'm not dogging anybody who is the biggest fan of this. Like, I don't I don't love the the Ben and Ray romance. It's just not my jam. And I, I would have been more um, delighted i think had ray ultimately been a nobody because i love the idea of the democratization of the force um but again like i none of that chagrined me in any kind of deep existential way um there's still so much beautiful stuff to look at i would really really love a zori bliss series um Mm. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's super fun. It's Star Wars, right? Um, like Amira, I was like, well, oh, this isn't my favorite, but I don't, I still went and saw it in the theater a whole bunch of times. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there's always great stuff to look at and like visually you're not going to get anything better. And um, there are parts of the story that I really, really did love. So uh, it's a mixed bag for me, but I mean, it, it's Star Wars at the end of the day. So 
Well, I, I think the force is with us because it appears the three of us uh, are on three sides of the spectrum, which which I think is wonderful. And I like what you said, it's still Star Wars. And I've always said, Star Wars is like pizza. Even when it's not great, it's better than anything else. <laughs> right. but, but I would call the Rise of Skywalker a really bad frozen pizza that's been in the freezer probably a little bit too long. <laughs> Don't don't sugarcoat it, Dan. How do you feel? Oh, I haven't even started. No, it's it's. Uh, I think the Last Jedi is a masterpiece, and Me I too. and I think it, I think it elevates the the narrative and the power of of this mythology to a, to a level unprecedented in Star Wars. And then I feel like the Rise of Skywalker kind of missed the boat. And in fact, it's my least favorite Star Wars film. That being said, there there are certain elements that I like. I think I think Daisy really was amazing. For the first time, and I know Amira, this is going to put us at odds. I actually liked Kylo Ren. Uh, uh, I I thought his story was finally strong, and I thought he worked really well. I didn't think it was possible for me to like some to re, for him to be redeemed. I didn't think that would be plausible, and I think that they made it work. I was disappointed that Ben Solo had no lines except for Owl. I was. <laughs> I think that's a huge problem, and and I and I think that Ray is is was my favorite character in the sequel trilogy, and I feel like she did a disservice. And even saying this out loud, I don't usually say these kind of things on Coffee with Kenobi because I've never quibbled with how a story in Star Wars is told. I may not like every nuance, but I still appreciate the mythology and the effort, and I still appreciate the mythology and the effort. But the way this story was told fell flat for me. And I think that one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, well, I think there are two. One, I think Poe and Finn were not given their just due in the story. And I think they dropped certain threads, especially with Finn. He just kind of went away. Uh, both yeah. his his uh, sensitivity with the Force and his, his dynamic with Rose was completely eradicated for no story-driven reason. And then the fact that Ray is the granddaughter of Palpatine. Before we address the interview itself, and Holly, we'll just go back to you for this one uh, to start off. How do you feel about Ray as a Palpatine? Does that strengthen or lessen her? I know there was a lot of consternation online about how she's related. Does that diminish her as a character? Where, where do you feel about that? I mean, like I said before, like I really loved the idea of her as a nobody. Um, to me, that was sort of the great setup of Last Jedi was that there is the potential for anyone to be a hero, right? Um, and that that's kind of like that final shot of Last Jedi with the kid with the broom where you're like, oh, there are a lot of people who could potentially rise up and make something really amazing. Um, I never got attached to any of the things theories about her lineage i wasn't ever super confident that they would make her a nobody even though i had that was kind of my favored um you know i mean i certainly know there are people that were rooting for it to be any number of people whether that be um you know for her to be a kenobi or a solo or and there was a time after force awakens where i thought she might be a solo um but yeah i uh I don't, I don't love her being Palpatine's offspring. But so the, so but the big I don't question know is, what I yeah. would have loved. Right. Well, I, I think uh, you, it sounds like you, you sort of, you mentioned it and I feel the same way. I thought that her being a nobody was excellent because I think one of the best things about Star Wars is it is about family, not always a surrogate family. Uh, this is the notion that Ray is someone, you know, being a teacher and coming from a divorced family myself, I think it's very powerful to say, you know what, who your parents are, who, who they aren't, that doesn't define who you are. You get to shape your own destiny, your own path. And I, I just love that so much. I mean, they could have had her related to Porgs, and I would have been fine with it. But, <laughs> but for some Listen, reason... <laughs> Palpatine did some weird science, so we don't know that that's ruled out. That's true. <laughs> that's true. The I, But I still think... Uh, for some reason, her the notion of her being a, a Palpatine, Amira, it just kind of, it seemed a little bit, I don't know, it just didn't seem to fit with what they had planned from the beginning. And we're going to get to how story and narrative is structured anyway, but what how, what do you think, Amira? I mean, it, it, I, am, I agree with the two of you, obviously. I actually love The Last Jedi, 
um, when I came out of seeing that, I cried. Like I cried so many tears because I just, I loved that story. And I know that many do not, but I've been fighting that fight since I saw it. I just, I thought it was so poetic. I love the, the little touches of comedy in it. Um, and I love the ending, just like the two of you said. I love that she didn't have a lineage that we could guess. It was just, she's just a girl, a scavenger, but she turns out to be one of the most powerful beings. Um, and I think that if they would have just left that alone, the connection that people could have kept with her, um, it just would have taken it to another level because people connect with Ray, obviously. Uh, but it just would have been at a totally different level because so many people think, well, you know, I don't come from this type of background. So w do I mean something? And I know that's taking it to such a deep end for Star Wars, but these types of films touch people in those ways. And I think if they would have just left that where it was, that we could have gotten a better storyline mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and nine, we could have gotten it. Um, I, the Palpatine thing, you know, as soon as we heard the voice and all of that and, and we found out uh, the connection, I could see why maybe they would connect it. Uh, just kind of given the prequel lovers a little, a little uh, taste to, to get them excited and, you know, giving those of us who love the originals uh, our taste of it. Um, but I just, I, it felt like it came out of thin air. Am I allowed to say that? Of course. Um, <laughs> it's encouraged. Like it, di it did not feel like it was part of the story we were supposed to have from the beginning, which is fair. disappointing. But, yeah. you know, they made it work, I guess. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's fair. Uh, Holly, you want to add to that before I ask the next question? Thinking. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be that horrible person that no. answers a question in a no. discussion with no. Uh, no, but I, I mean, I think Amira put it really beautifully, right? It, it seemed a little, it was a little startling, not necessarily in like a, oh, that was an amazing reveal, but kind of like a, huh, did we really have, hmm, okay. Um, it was a gimmick. It felt like a gimmick. It didn't feel like an organic yeah. part of storytelling that was telegraphed from the beginning. And, and I don't mean telegraphed because I like to be surprised. Obviously, I'm so anti-spoiler anyway. But it's more like where there's seeds planted. So so let's just go ahead and talk about what Daisy really talked about with Josh Gad. And Josh point blank asked her, you know, talk about Ray's lineage, where she was from. Is that something that was planted from the beginning? And she said, no, it was changing a lot. They toyed with the idea of her being a Kenobi then she was going to be a nobody for a while. And then they said, oh, you're Palpatine's granddaughter. And then they said, no, actually, we're going to do something else. So that in and of itself is not bad. That is not bad storytelling. This is how it works. And, and people who are fans of this mythology, both behind the camera and in front of the camera, are well aware that Darth Vader wasn't Luke's father in A New Hope. That was not the plan. There wasn't really yeah. necessarily a plan or a clear concrete vision. Luke and Leia were not brother and sister until Return of the Jedi was being created. So it's not like this is something that is unheard of. The, the storytelling, and when Holly, when you and I were texting before this happened, we talked very briefly about how stories are told. And this in and of itself is not an indicator that Lucasfilm or Disney is failing. No. <laughs> Because <laughs> you'll hear no. that, and it's it's silly. It's absurd. Well, yeah. I mean, here's the thing, right? I ha you. This is a dangerous space because I get a little soapboxy. One, there are so many instances throughout film history of creators who were making significant changes to films as they go, right? The the thing I thought of, which isn't quite a one to one comparison, but like. Everyone that I know, I'm trying to think if I've ever known a detractor to this particular statement, thinks, for example, that Hayao Miyazaki is a genius. Do you know none of his films are planned? They animate in order because they're making it up as they go along. <laughs> 
So, like, when you look at something like a Spirited Away or a Totoro or, mm-hmm. you know, any of those that are these amazing, super creative things, those they didn't know when they started production where that was going to land. They didn't know what the story beats were. They didn't know. They may have had, like, vague outline, but everything changes. And that's part of the creative process, right? Like, I don't know anybody that is creative and has ever made a thing, whether that's like a painting, a garment, a, you know, a short film, a long film, a book, like everything goes through massive changes along the way. And so it's frustrating to me to see people that maybe aren't necessarily creators in that way, placing judgments on the way that creatives do work because like, that's not your right, frankly. And it's very, so, it's very. Is limiting. that too harsh? No, that's not <laughs> harsh <laughs> enough. Come nope. on, did I get the right Holly on the phone? Come on. <laughs> no, right. I, I think I totally agree with you, and and I agree. There's, you know, if you if people have ever written something that is longer than 280 characters, then they understand that there is there is a process that goes to creating that goes to writing. Heck, even telling uh, my kids a bedtime story. You know, it goes through a lot of iterations in my mind, right. you know, and that's just a natural process that in and of itself is not a measure. And, and quite honestly, I'm again, I'm breaking a lot of coffee with Kenobi rules. I think Kathleen Kennedy is wonderful. I think she's a nice person. I've had the good fortune to talk with her a few times. And I know that this is very important to her. This is not only her job, but she's passionate about stories and storytelling. I mean, George Lucas personally handed her the company and it was for a reason. Because she's good at what she does. This does because however it worked, it didn't work. It's 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 okay. This is an organic part of storytelling, very much a part of the storytelling process. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, I will return with Amira and Holly to discuss how stories are told, how things happen during the creative process, and would it matter if Ray was a Kenobi? This is Coffee with Kenobi. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books but can't find the time? Try listening to them on audio, featuring sound effects, top-notch narrators, and music directly from the movies. Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. Discover Thrawn's origins within the Chiss Ascendancy in the first title in an epic new Star Wars trilogy, beginning with Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy. Written by best-selling author Timothy Zahn and read by Mark Thompson, Thrawn Ascendancy is on sale now, and if you're looking for a full cast audio drama, don't forget to try Dr. Afra, read by an all-star cast, including Mark Thompson, Catherine Tabor, Jonathan Davis, and more. Dr. Afra is on sale now. Visit penguinrandomhouseaudio.com slash Star Wars to listen to clips and find your next listen, or buy now wherever audiobooks are sold. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. MEI and Mouse Fan Travel is your one-stop shop for your vacation needs and your plans to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, or the cruise lines. Travel looks much different now than it did a couple of months ago, and with the opening of Walt Disney World and soon, hopefully, the opening of Disneyland, You need a place to go where you can trust and they will help you figure out and navigate all the different circumstances and guidelines that Disney has put out for you. And I can say that we had our vacation modified and as soon as dates were announced, MEI contacted me directly to help me reschedule, which is exactly what I was hoping to do. So if you are interested in rescheduling your vacation or want to try to plan a Walt Disney World Disneyland vacation or anywhere else you want to go on the planet, be sure to contact MEI and Mouse Fan Travel at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel. Their signature service and expert advice will help you maximize your vacation time and dollar, and they will help you figure out all the different changes and modifications going on at the Disney theme parks. They are amazing, and I can tell you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, the peace of mind that Becky Mencken and the crew at MEI and Mouse Fan Travel have given me is invaluable. If you're interested at all, Again, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel. And, you know, I could certainly get on a a pretty massive soapbox about it as well. I certainly have in class because once in a while, in fact, just last week, someone said to me, Mr. Zare, 
uh, because as soon as they found out I wrote that book with Pablo, they're like, oh, okay, so I got to test this guy, right? I got to test Mr. Zare. So they, <laughs> which I, I love, I love. They don't know what they're getting into. And I said, they said, Mr. Zare, didn't Anakin make C-3PO? And I said, yeah, he did. And he goes, well, so Anakin gives it to Luke. Shouldn't Luke give it back to C-3PO? Because technically C-3PO is a Skywalker. And I said, that would be like me making grilled cheese and saying that grilled cheese is a Zare. That doesn't make any sense. It's, or C-3PO is not organic. And he says, but why does Rey deserve the lightsaber? She's not a Skywalker. And I said, then we start talking about what does family mean? It's not always about blood. But I feel like that's kind of a pervasive attitude out there, Amira, that somehow Rey has to be defined by the fact that she is or isn't a Kenobi or a Skywalker or a Solo or what have you. I agree. Yeah. I And what has been interesting to watch in the reactions to all of this is people thinking that they are entitled to something. Yes. Like, oh, well, we, we should have been told. And it's like, you don't need to be told anything. This is how <laughs> they decided they wanted to end this. Like, you can't decree something as you know, someone who obviously does not work for Lucasfilm, but you're making a stink everywhere. It doesn't make sense to do that. It doesn't make sense to say that we were duped or they told us this or they gave us this inclination. Or I, I have seen a lot of, you know, Kathy Kennedy mentioning uh, going on as well. Well, she said this in this interview and this, I was like, she was saying what was happening at the moment. Do you guys not understand how any of that works? Like if you're a fan of film, you understand how that works. Like they will be in an interview and say in the moment what they can say to us in the moment. But things can change just like we obviously learned from this interview with Daisy. She's like, first they said it was this and then maybe a Kenobi and then, you know, Palpatine is a granddad. Like that's how it works. And I understand that that can be frustrating when yes. you're not creating something. But it, we they don't have you. We have no rights. That's uh, we have no rights right. and no one should be shouting to the rooftops about how, you know, they they're doing our fandom wrong. They are not. No one's doing that to us. We're still getting the storylines that we can follow and characters we can love and fall in love with again. We're still getting that. So this uproar over I don't even know how long that interview was, 4 minutes. Yeah. It just seems so dial it seems just it, it's crazy to me. It literally is crazy to me to see the reaction to it when, number one, the movie's over. Let it go. <laughs> That's right. My <laughs> wife says to go. me probably weekly, let it go, Elsa. I'll be ranting about something. <laughs> right. Okay, can I just say, number one, Amira, I'm in love with you, too. Um, <laughs> right? This is This is the thing that I always tell people to echo what you said. Like, you are more than welcome to like or not like a piece of art or creation, but you cannot dictate what an artist does because that's not how art works. Right. Amen. And that's exactly the problem here, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think part of it, and I understand to some degree, because I really try to be empathetic and think about, like, why people get so attached to these things, why it upsets them so deeply, and I think for so many of us, right, the mythos of Star Wars is so big. And in some ways, it defines people's worldviews so deeply that they do want to feel like there was always, you know, almost like a holy book level plan for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it is cool that you connect to this particular creative, huge juggernaut that way. But like, you, it's so unrealistic to expect that one, something that collaborative would have, I mean, there are roots that have certainly been laid out for a long time. And a lot of these creators that are, you know, fairly new to the Star Wars universe are still reaching back to source material that was, you know, part of George Lucas's bank of ideas. But like, they're not just there as like acolytes to carry out something that someone else did. Like they have to do their own creation as well. And perhaps the, the most delicious piece of irony in this cake uh, of fiction is that suddenly, you know, in the in the 90s, it was very, in early 2000s, it was very, oh, George Lucas is ruining Star Wars, blah, blah, blah. Now everyone is decreeing <laughs> from the rooftops. Why didn't we go with George's plan? 
And, and I find that to be really kind of delicious because I, I appreciate the dramatic irony of that. And yes, I mean, whether whatever you like or don't like, that's wonderful that I respect that. And I empathize. Look, I, I ranted that day at lunch with some of my other teacher buddies how I wish that Ray was a Kenobi. And we'll get to where the pros and cons of what that might have been. But, but, to, <laughs> but to, to, to Amira, I like that you said entitlement because I think there is a degree of entitlement there. And we sort of live, not sort of, we 100% live in this culture where being an expert suddenly doesn't mean what it actually means. But if you are uh, if someone at, at the highest level of entertainment making billions of dollars for a company, this is not a decision that is, that is made lightly, right? As, as you both said so beautifully, the creative process is such that it is malleable. It changes over time. Sometimes things look good on paper, and then when you start to shoot it, that doesn't work. So you have to make changes. And that's an organic part of the story and storytelling. And it's great. I mean, I'm pretty sure that when Stephen King sits down to write a book, and he's written, what, 10,000 of them? I think that's an exact number, by the way. He, he, it changes over time. That is, that is a part of the process. And to, to tie yourself so intensely to anything that is fiction, you're just leading yourself to disappointment. And, and I certainly don't wish that for anyone. And, and honestly, The Phantom Menace, which, which I absolutely love, when I first saw that film, when I left the theater in 1999, the person I was with said, what'd you think? And I said, I don't think I liked it. And I stayed up all <laughs> night, and not because I had to do a lot of podcasts the next day, but because I I just couldn't stop thinking about it, and then I just sort of got over myself and made peace with it. But I learned a valuable lesson. Don't anticipate, participate. Enjoy what's there. Uh, if there's something that you don't like, then critical thinking, intellectual honesty lead the way to a wonderful discussion, and that's great. But to get so tied up and to become so entitled that something is suddenly wrong because it's not what you wanted, I mean... That's what my my kids did when they were three and four. I just don't get that. That's probably the harshest I've ever been on the show. <laughs> this is what this is what we do. Holly and I bring out the worst in you. We get <laughs> this all would of, not be the first the time anger. someone said that about me. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I mean I, I you know go ahead. Um. I interviewed someone lately who made a really great statement that I feel like applies here about like how it is okay to be critical of something, but it's, it's easy to criticize. It's hard to be critical Mm -hmm. and to really like look at something in a thoughtful way and take it in and really address it for what it is instead of just complaining about it. Yes. And like, like I said, you, I don't expect everybody to like everything about Star Wars and certainly not the same things I like. I don't like everything that's ever been done in Star Wars, no. but it is, it's so easy to say they should have done X, Y, or Z. And it's like, okay, but have you thought about why they actually made these choices? And it might not be the reason that you're down with, but mm-hmm. that doesn't mean it's not worth considering. Absolutely. And, and there's, I think there's something to be said for, I think that, that criticism and being, and you being a critic and I mean, you've done a, done a lot of reviews of stuff and stuff, not only things that you like, but also, is this something that's okay for kids? I love reading your stuff about, is this something that is safe for kids to watch? What's the latest Disney plus movie, theatrical release of something. I think that's good. I think that, I think it's a talent because if you like everything or if you dislike everything, I feel like that, then I can't trust you as a critic. I mean, I think right. if you say your no makes your yeses have much more weight. So I, I tend to kind of roll my eyes politely when someone says that they like everything Star Wars and every story because I think, well, really? Everything? I, I just I find that to be a little disingenuous. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it, you need to actually take a minute to think about what you're, what you're viewing. And I love that Holly keeps bringing up that, you know, this is art and mm-hmm. not – every artistic piece is loved by every person all over the world. Some people are very passionate about it. And some people are like, what the heck is that? And that's how it should be. Uh, you have to be discerning about that's everything, right. even in our fandom. And it, it's, it's great. And this is why I love being on here when you invite me on is because we just, the two of us, we have things where you absolutely love them. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, Dan, absolutely not. And we can talk about <laughs> that. Yes. And, that's the one of the my favorite parts about being a Star Wars fan mm-hmm. is that when you're a when you're a fan, a genuine fan, you 
accept that others may like things that you don't and you're excited to have those conversations with them. It's not something where you're going to dismiss them or, you know, you say that they're stupid for loving it. It's it's the heart of our fandom that we each pick what we love and we embrace it and we can debate about it passionately, but also at the end of the debate, we can hug it out and just say, That's this right. is this is how we are. This is why we're all family. This is and the way. This, this is the way. Listen, uh, look at you. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why this is just, it just seems silly to me. This, everything that, that's happening and things that are been, being said about this interview, it just, I hope in the end people realize what they're saying and they go, man, what was I thinking? Why did I even say that? That's what I'm hoping for, for those true mm-hmm. fans to really go, man, I, I lost it for a minute over a four yeah. minute interview. I probably shouldn't have said all those things. Right. And then we can get back to work here. <laughs> Amen to that. Like, look, I love Star Wars. It's done so many great things for my, for me, for my family. It's given me a second career. It's taken me literally all over the world, but it's not important. It's fun. It's a wonderful escape. I've met the two of you. I've met so many great people because of Star Wars. But it's supposed to be an escape. And if something doesn't work for you, then just like you said, Amira, like there's nothing I like better than when someone disagrees with me because I can learn from them. I can get their point of view. I can glean where they're coming from. And I can step out of my comfort zone and start to understand a different point of view, which is a very Star Wars thing anyway. So that's great. You can open up discourse. But if there are people that don't disagree and can't look at it intellectually or critically, that's fine. But uh, at my table, I just don't have time for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I had a whole cartoon that ran in my head of like, you know, you turning away someone with their cafeteria tray. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> move along, this buddy. Table champ. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> or we pick up our trays and move to the other table. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of school. All right, so before we wrap up, let's just let's just indulge for a moment because we're going to have some fun with this and we're going to show that we can talk about Star Wars as we've been doing and, uh, and see different sides of, of, of the cube, so to speak. So, Holly, let's just yeah. pretend that Ray was a Kenobi. Would that have changed your overall thoughts on this film and the mythology in general? And if so, how? Um, hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put what's going on in my head. Oh, I have faith in you. Oh, this is misplaced. Um, <laughs> I feel like uh, for many people, part of what made it appealing for Ray to be a Kenobi is that they like to imagine hot Ewan McGregor <laughs> having romantic <laughs> interludes, right? That's part of the appeal for people. Well, that's mine for sure. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I didn't want to throw you under the bus, Dan, but, um, <laughs> which I get. But I feel like, to me, if that had been the case, this entire thing becomes a whole different level of heartbreak that would take some of the joy out of it. Not, not because I would think it's a bad idea, but I would spend all that time thinking about how he probably didn't know that he had a family that he could have gone to you know what I mean? Like he would have gotten cheated out of an entire lifetime or even the choice to make probably right. Like it presumes that, that he and Satine is the usual pairing, right? Not that he had some like mystery, mystery romance that we don't know about. Like it, it makes that such a tragedy that it would kind of overshadow a lot of stuff for me. Um, yeah, I think that's my stance no, on that one. No, fair. And, and and then it would add to this uh, uncomfortable trope in Star Wars of absentee fathers, which I, I'm not a fan of. Mm, right. So, uh, Amir, what about you? Would would that have changed anything for you? Would have enhanced or detracted if Ray was, in fact, a Kenobi? I don't think so. I mean, I if you would have asked me that after I saw The Force Awakens... I would would have said absolutely because I was on the Kenobi train after after that. Um, I really was like, oh, that would be great. Uh, and then they just messed it all up with the Last Jedi. Like they messed it up for me, and I was like, you know what? She doesn't need that. And I, I think that I was able to let that go. Um, and it just it would have been very complicated. And that's something that I don't think they would have been able to explain even in the two movies after The Force Awakens. Like, I don't think they would have been able to do enough 
for us um, to kind of get us on that that mindset of her being a Kenobi. Like th- there was, there would have had to been a lot of Ray storytelling, and there was so much other. Um, interactions going on in the storyline that they wouldn't have been able to give enough time. And I think maybe that's probably why they didn't go with it. Uh, it's just, it, it's very layered. And because they're, because Ben is just so, Ben Kenobi is so uh, beloved, um, they would have had to really like kind of step on eggshells with that. Like there was no way they could have tarnished him for us. And I don't think that would have gone over very well. Um, so I, I don't, I, I think it would have changed things for me after seeing The Last Jedi, um, just because I just, I was so in love with her being just a regular person who just happened to have these amazing connections to the force. And I would have been like, ah, do we, do we really have to, do we really have to do this? Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad that we didn't go down that path. And I know, you know, we went down the Palpatine path, but I, I don't think that we would have been satisfied with her being a Kenobi in the long run. Sure. No, I love both of your perspectives. I would say, I think the biggest challenge for me about Ray Palpatine is that I can't imagine Palpatine at the singles bar. How are you doing? You know, I, <laughs> I just don't get that image. I don't want that image. Thank you. <laughs> Well, isn't I mean, isn't it kind of hinted that his his son was a clone? Yeah, very. Oh no, it's it's directly stated in the novel. Yeah, because let's face it, like. <laughs> I like where this is going already. I love it. Sheath Palpatine is bad boyfriend material. Like you don't want any part of that. <laughs> That's right. I know some people are drawn to power, but like yeah. I feel like he would be non delightful in a relationship, and moreover, I don't think he would have cared about it do you know what i mean of like of course n- there's none of that and um, he could charge your phone for you with his finger so that's about it i don't think he would he'd be like a waste of my waste of my talents <laughs> that's right i broke it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i if if ray i wish i do wish that ray would have been a nobody uh because she would that would have made her more than we would have made her very much as somebody because she again has to Find her own path. I think Ray's most the most fascinating thing about Ray, which we've seen about two and a third of the sequel trilogy, is the internal struggle. I think the internal conflict is the most compelling thing in story in storytelling because I think that is the most relatable. We we we're not all going to go against the Death Star or fight the Kraken or fight Apollo Creed, but we are going to fight our internal demons, and those battles never go away. That's one of the things I liked about Kanan Jarrus and Rebels is that. He conquered his demons, but then new ones showed up because that's reality. We all, as adults, know that you, there are certain things that we struggle with, and then we take care of it, and then it comes back in a different form. And I think that's that's more real. That's, you know, when the ancient Greeks created their heroes, that was sort of uh, one of the impetuses for that is, is making something somewhat relatable because you're not a superhero, but you can have super problems that seem daunting to you. And if she were a Kenobi, would I have loved it? Yes, I would have loved it. I thought it would have been great, but I didn't need it. I didn't follow any of the rumor stuff, of course. I have this wonderful ability because, again, as a kid, I didn't, like, literally, when my wife says she's going Christmas shopping, I say, please don't tell me what what stores you're going to. Why? Because I don't want to accidentally guess something. I like to be surprised. So I hid, (laughs) I hid, this true story. So I hid from all rumors, all speculation. I muted Star Wars, everything on Twitter, all the main characters I muted because I just don't want to know. I'd like to be surprised. And when I found out, I remember saying, eh, okay, whatever. I guess ultimately it doesn't matter. Let's just kind of see where they take it. And there's still places they can go. But but to say that it is retcon that Ray was going to be a Kenobi, that is simply not true. That is disingenuous. And there's no basis for it. She said, we toyed with the idea. It's part of the creative process, part of how stories are told. And it is what it is, shall we say. (laughs) Would it not have broken your heart to think that Ben Kenobi spent all that time in the desert of Tatooine alone when he could have been with his family? Exactly. Exactly. See, see, on first blush, think, oh, cool, Ray's a Kenobi. That's cool. There's the the lineage. But I think for some people, and again, boy, I'm breaking all the rules. Uh, Like, (laughs) people thought, oh, Ray can't be powerful because she's not a Skywalker Kenobi. Sorry, that's 100% wrong. 
Ray can be powerful because she's Ray. That that's all that it needs to be. It's who she is. She had to fight her way to survive on Jakku by herself. It's not like Unkar Plutt is father knows best. You know, he's probably the opposite of that. So yeah, if and then on on further review, if if Kenobi was a grand because he'd have to be a grandfather because age wise it just wouldn't have made any sense because the Force yeah. Awakens is three years after anyway. It would have been very disappointing because again, I, we don't need more absentee fathers. There's enough of that in the real world. You know, we we want we want right. we want um, love. We want compassion. We want someone to be nurturing, and that wouldn't have been the case. So it's it's best that it was left on the cutting room floor. And maybe that's why one of the reasons they did that. I, I agree. Would, I would hope that was part of the decision process. Yeah. I agree. Um. I I love that you touched on something I definitely wanted to I don't know reiterate clarify sure I I feel like people get really attached to the idea of versions of movies mm-hmm. I mean we kind of have gone through it as a fandom with like the original original trilogy the special edition or and like people like to hash it out for some people conflict is super fun and they like to have that argument mm-hmm me not so much um but i i always feel like when i see discussions along these lines of something like this that comes out there start to be these weird theories i find them weird where people are like i bet so and so wanted to do this and this other person in the mix kneecapped them and made an executive decision that it had to be this way and like I, one, as we have all been saying, like film is collaborative and that's part of it. But two, like the movie that came out is the movie. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's There's it. not like a secret cut of it lurking in a vault somewhere that they're like, but this is the real one because they would have put that one out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no one, no one, Tanya Harding, your creators, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. We can blame the Snyder cut for that, maybe. I don't know. Oh, I don't. I'm, I'm not even gonna touch oh, that boy. one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the movie is the movie. That's what was made. That's what happened. And you know, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, it made over a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. So something went well, and we're still talking about it, which I think is a really fun thing. I really, really wish I could time travel and just go forward. You know, fifteen, twenty years, and see how people are talking about the sequel trilogy. Oh, they'll all love it. Just like Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> right. That's something I bring up a lot, too, on Full of Sith, is that uh, one of the things that I think we miss from, I hate to use the phrase the discourse, but like, you know, from the fandom discussion now is the kids, just by the nature of it, right? And like, we are at a point now where the people that were kids when the prequel trilogy came out are adults and they can discuss and elaborate and talk about those films with the same love that those of us that are older have always talked about the original trilogy. And Mm. I love the prequels, but like, I can't wait to hear in that like 15 or 20 years, what those people that are adults then that are kids now feel about it. And like, I want to hear their take as like a 23 year old on what the Palpatine thing did to their brain when they were nine. Like, that's what I'm really excited (laughs) about. I agree. I agree. I mean, Mason, we we don't really watch the rise of Skywalker because uh, the older boys are just like doing their own thing. But, but Mason who's seven, he's scared of Palpatine. He thinks he's, he's super scary and frightening. And quite honestly, he is in that movie and, and that's okay. You know, that different strokes for different folks. Uh, but yeah, I agree. It's going to be very, you know, time has a tendency to sort of change perspectives on things. And it will be interesting to see. Amira, uh, before we wrap up the show, any closing thoughts on this topic? Besides how much you enjoyed talking to Holly and, and me, of I course. I do. This was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> closing thoughts. I I I just I just think this is I just think this is a little silly. I know I've said that already. already. I just mm-hmm. the silliness behind it is comical to me. Um, I don't think that it's as big of a deal as people want it to be, and I I feel like they we're in an energy right now where people are trying to make something very small into a big deal. Um, but you know you have to you have to enjoy that 
we're still we're still pretty lively about our fandom and that we can have conversations like this one, hop on a podcast and talk this out. Um, and that we love it so much that the reactions to certain things can bring out the best and worst of us, but that it, it helps us really take a minute to kind of realize what we love the most about Star Wars. Um, even when it is very silly and comical, the reactions to certain things. Uh, but then you can have these long conversations like we did tonight and really talk about the things that matter to us and the things that maybe we should let go of uh, and what really is truly important to our fandom is that we love this story and everybody loves it in their own way and we will never lose the passion for it. And I just, I'm excited to see what else everybody's going to get all up in arms about because it's, it's entertaining <laughs> to me. It really is very entertaining. <laughs> get the popcorn kids. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Holly, any closing thoughts for you? Um, I mean, I, I would hope, it's kind of in the same vein of what Amira said. I, I would hope that people, if there are people feeling genuine chagrin over this, I hope that they can take a step back and like look at the bigger picture and realize that what's making them dismayed over something not turning out the way that they wished is really because they love this thing so much. And maybe just go back to the things that you love about it and focus on those because that will ultimately make you happier. Like you can't, you can't change what came out in December, but what you can do is just like either never watch that movie again and watch the ones you love or watch it and look for the parts that you do love or, you know, just find ways to engage with other content that you like that gives you joy instead of chagrin. That's right. Man does not live on Star Wars alone. There, there are plenty of other wonderful things out there, things you like, things you're not sure about. I, think, I also think it's kind of fun, and I challenge my students this all the time. Try to find pearls in things you're not sure about. What can you learn from yes. it? What can you take from it? How can you take that and, and come up with you know rhetoric and intelligent intellectual discourse uh, let's talk about the narrative, why it was done, and uh, I think you'll find a lot of peace in that. I love that. That's brilliant. Thank you. I have moments. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. It is a lot of fun, and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. A big thank you to our CWK Alliance members, Mary Perdue, Terrence King, Smooth Rivera, Dan Caperso, Aaron, Jim Tallman, J.C. Poe, Ed Kimoto, Greg McLaughlin, Robert Avila, Dustin Mills, Yancey Evans, Chelsea Sansbury, Connie Shi, Tyler Pampa, Hannah, Alex Procasio, Ian Thompson, David Nicely, Simbot Detradarian, Christine Turk, Kurt McKellen, Ross Halibin, Dan Ream, Colby Mead, Alexander Moylan, Frank Mulder, Blake Weaver, Jim Capron, Chris Metz, LJ Souter, Aaron Harris, Chris Gavarka, Jeff Ellis, Daz Davies, Susan Gray, Thea Selby, Christian Dale, Brian McKinney, Jason Hall, Jared Cantor, Eric Struthers, Mark Suter, 
Angela Sauce, and Dennis Keithley. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash CWK Alliance and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over, hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, live video, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, please feel free to reach out to me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zer, M-R-Z-E-H-R. There are also a lot of ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with Kenobi and check us out on Pinterest. You can find me twice a month on the podcast Looking at Lucasfilm, part of the Jim Hill Media Podcast Network, and you can find my writing on CWK's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I'm an official blogger there, as well as on IGN, where I contribute articles on Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. And if you're considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and help you make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanZMedia.com where we can get the process started. I'm also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. You can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our CWK sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. And don't forget to pre-order my brand new book that I wrote alongside Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton, the Star Wars book published by DK. Be sure to pre-order your copy of the Star Wars book today. I can't wait to share it with each and every one of you. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word. Go to iTunes and search Coffee with Kenobi and you'll see the show there. My circle of friends has grown so much because of this podcast and each and every one of you, and it means so much to me that we have such a wonderful Star Wars community. Thank you all so much for all you do. Very well, I, I can't tell the both of you enough how much I appreciate the both of you, your intelligence, your humor, your outlook on these things. And undoubtedly, if people are not only following you both already, they're going to want to do so after this conversation. So Amira, where can people find you and all of your wonderful work? Uh, well, my website is fourhatsandfrugal.com. So you guys can come over there and see our family fun and all the crazy, amazing things that our family of five loves to do. Um, if you want to chat all things Star Wars, you can definitely find me over on Twitter. I'm Amira Martin on Twitter. Uh, I also co-own the Star Wars Mom um, with a wonderful Star Wars fan named Liz Porter. So we actually have a Facebook group. You guys can come join us there. We have a Facebook page as well. And we talk all things Star Wars all the time and there. Um, and you can find me on YouTube as well. I, I talk about Star Wars every once in a while over there. Uh, same name, Amira Martin. Um, and I think that's it. That's everywhere. I love it. And of course, you can see uh, some of Amira's greatest hits on the Target commercial, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you again, Amira, so much. And Holly, where can everyone find you? I know you mentioned quite a few podcasts at the top oh of the show. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. No, I'm like a, it's don't. kind of a jerk list. No, it's um, a beautiful list. <laughs> You, you seriously I, are amazing. I, I can't. I just I mean picture it. people being like, another, really? <laughs> Sit down. No, it's uh, great. Uh, yeah, um, I will I will keep it short and sweet and say you can find all those podcasts I listed on the iHeartRadio app or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Uh, Full of Sith, of course, is at fullofsith.com and is everywhere on social media as Full of Sith. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter as Surliest Girl and on Instagram as SurlyGirly5. I'll tell you I'm getting very excited for the holidays because I have Star Wars holiday things planned. 
Oh, I cannot <laughs> wait. It'll be all over Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> great. I'm preparing for Batu and Harvest Festival right now. Oh, oh great. My gosh. Are I'm you going so back? excited. <laughs> Are you going back soon? No. Um, no. I'm I am I have no interest in a crowd right now. Um, I don't blame you. But and I don't think they're doing it. It was a thing that came up in Cole's right. um his uh travel guide to Batu. Mm-hmm the book that came out uh, a few weeks back and there's one page that mentions holidays on Batu, and one of them is Batu and Harvest Festival uh, one of them is their um, they have a life day celebration there because lots of Wookiees hang out on Batu, <laughs> and um, then they have like what they call Black Spire Day which just happens to fall on May the 4th so um, we'll get to that but right now I'm all about Harvest Festival and life day plans I, I'm telling you, if I ever go into Batu and there's a Christmas tree next to the Millennium Falcon, I'm probably going to die on the spot from joy. It's going to happen. Don't do that. Um. <laughs> I mean, I'll come back as a forest ghost, of course. <laughs> See, now I feel like you should smuggle a small Christmas tree in so you can do like a force perspective photo of Ooh. the Falcon and a Christmas oh, tree together. My. It's happening. I like that challenge. I love Free it. ideas. I got them all day. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you both so very much. Thank you so much thank for you, having Dan. Does it get any better than those two? Honestly, what a wonderful conversation. And again, thank you for indulging me as I t- certainly took a different perspective than we ever have in seven years of coffee with Kenobi. Normally, we like to deal with what is as opposed to what might be or what could have been. But I felt like it was important to address it, and I knew that Holly and Amir were the perfect people to talk about this with on the show. Be sure to join me Monday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time for CWK Live on Facebook. This week, we're going to talk about your top five favorite moments or images involving Star Wars iconography. So any image, any silhouette, any poster, any character starship whatever it is if that is a moment of star wars iconography that speaks to you join us and let us know your thoughts on the top five it's so fun it's incredibly interactive probably the most interactive we've ever gotten to be on coffee with kenobi so we would love to have you join us have a great week and weekend everybody and remember this is the podcast you're looking for This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along. Move along. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. Discover Thrawn's origins within the Chiss Ascendancy in the first title in an epic new Star Wars trilogy, beginning with Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy. Written by best-selling author Timothy Zahn and read by Mark Thompson, Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy is on sale now wherever audiobooks are sold.